Well, come this round. Second one. session. Great boy. How many were here earlier? How many were not? Okay, I'll go over. So uh, we're going to continue with the uh, crucifixion of the warrior god, part two. Let's give him a great hand. Okay, so this is called cross. This is called conundrum. The conundrum. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. Is that it? Yeah, they are. Understand the body of the of God in the Old Testament and the cross. So, in the first hour, we uh, looked at uh, the cruciform of the Lord, which basically would correspond to the first volume of Crucifixion of the Warrior Gods. Um, and then, what I want to do in this hour is, is uh, talk about. The cruciform thesis, which is what results, if you read the Bible, in this cruciform way. But just by way of review, uh, for those of you who are here, uh, this is my great artistic drawing. <laughs> and, and what I'm, I, I'm sharing now, so about 11 years ago, I started to write a book that was going to try to defend God's behavior in the Old Testament. Got 50 pages into it and thought it was just trash, not convincing. I gave up on that. And, and I, I sat in this conundrum, the conundrum being that on the one hand, on the authority of Jesus, I have to embrace the whole Old Testament as inspired, because he does. And if I call him Lord, I can't correct his theology. Uh, but on the other hand, the New Testament presents the cross as not just one revelation among others, but as the revelation that culminates and surpasses all others. I spend some 200 pages uh, arguing that in Crucifixion of the Warrior God. And, um, uh, and, and, and so the, we, and, and all scripture is supposed to point to Jesus, whose whole ministry is centered around the cross. Um, and so the, the, the challenge here, I, mean, I, 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 I have to accept the Old Testament is inspired, but some of these portraits of God in the Old Testament can contradict what I learned about God in Jesus Christ. So I can't accept them. So what do I do here? And um, I shared in the first hour that I learned from origin that uh, when you come upon in, in seemingly impossible conundrums in scripture, um, do not get mad, it, certainly don't reject it because it's all God's word, but rather humble yourself, uh, submit yourself to the word, uh, humble yourself before the Holy Spirit, and keep on digging. And, and he's, he talks about these treasures that are underneath the text that you can only get to through digging. But he, he thought that God purposely put uh, puzzle, bewildering things in the Bible to force us to dig. Because that's what grows us and causes us to become more, more uh, dependent on, on, on the spirit and, and things of that sort. And so for several months, that's just what I did. I, 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 have, I have to accept the Old Testament, but I can't accept those pictures because God really looks like this. I'm going to trust that God really is as beautiful as he's revealed to be uh, on the cross. And then I had the kind of experience. It was a little bit like um, those magic eye books. Have you ever seen those magic eye things where you, you look at a page and it's all just sort of wallpaper? But if you look at it the right way, if you relax your eye, don't look at it, look through it. Be on these, which I never got. Uh, but then you'll see a three-dimensional object rising out of it. You couldn't see it there before, but all of a sudden it starts to rise out of it. Uh, first time I ever saw one of these was early 90s. I was at a uh, Christmas party, and they're passing around this magic eye book, and everybody was eventually seeing these dolphins. Oh, there they are, the stream of money. And then they give it to the next couple. And I was the only one who couldn't see the stupid dolphins. <laughs> I, I, I actually got to the point where I thought, this is a gag. This, they're, this is a big joke on me. They're all playing and they see dolphins, but there's no dolphins there. So I was like, I don't see any dolphins. Relax your eye. What does that mean? Look through it. I, well, I, I finally got it. I, the lady let me take the book home. And two weeks later, <laughs> I finally got it. And, it was, uh, and my wife was upstairs. And I was like, honey, I, I, I see it. I see it. And I walked up to her. I didn't want to take my eye off because I thought I'd lose it. Well, that's kind of what happened. Now, it, I'm not saying this is revelation. It could be my insanity. Who knows? But it was like I saw the cross arising out of these violent portraits of God. Uh, there's some, you know, portraits of God saying, slaughter everything that breathes. Uh, don't leave anything alive except don't rip the trees. Um, and yeah, just some horrendous things. Uh, you know, the law in, in Deuteronomy 22 you find a, uh, a captive woman attractive, uh, you can take her home to be your bride, um, give her 30 days to mourn her family, uh, and then take her home. But if she doesn't satisfy you, then you can turn her out. But you can't sell her. And, and so she, now this lady who just had her family wiped out and is living among foreigners is, could be turned out because he decided he wasn't satisfied with her. What's up with that? Um, there's some really ugly pictures there, but all scripture is supposed to point to the cross 
What I'm proposing is a way of understanding how they point to the cross. And that was the kind of magic eye sort of thing I got. So here's what I noticed. I began to see this when I asked the question, how does the cross become the definitive revelation of God for us? And, and what I came to see was that um, it's not what's on the surface of the cross. This is Jesus crucified for living. Uh, it, 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 the surface doesn't tell us what God is like. In fact, the surface tells us what our sin is like. It, it mirrors the ugliness of our sin. But this becomes... So if a person, if a non-believer looks at the cross, he doesn't get to see the definitive revelation of God. He sees a crucified criminal. But if the believer, but the difference is that the believer believes what Paul calls the message of the cross. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And so if when we by faith look through the service, and the, it's, it's God, the fact that God steps into this, that's what reveals God. He stoops to this level. Even to the point of becoming our sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21. And becoming our curse, Galatians 3.13. Which means God experiences the antithesis of himself. Which means God's go, God goes to the furthest extreme possible out of love for us. And the, the unsurpassable distance he crossed to become our sin and our curse reveals the unsurpassable perfection of the love that he is. And that's why John summarizes the whole revelation that we find in Jesus when he says, God is love, 1 John 4, 8. And here's how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. 1 John 3.16. So God is cross-like love. That is the very essence. But you, you only see that when you look through. When you have a, a faith, pen, or a surface penetrating faith, that can see the beautiful God stepping into this ugliness. So the cross is both, revol it's revoltingly beautiful. It's revolting on the surface, but it's beautiful in the depth. Yeah, and, and you see that there's something else going on. And that's how Paul becomes beautiful. So I propose that it, it so it's the God who breathed this revelation is the same God who breathed Scripture. That's uh, Theonoustos, Paul's word in 2 Timothy 3.16. Since it's the same God, and since God breathed all Scripture to point to the cross, shouldn't we ask the question, where else might God have revealed himself this way? If, if the cross reveals what God's truly like, it reveals what God's always been like. So God didn't start being self-sacrificial on the cross. No, he's self-sacrificial on the cross because he's always been like that. And so maybe we should read the Bible knowing uh, there might come times where God will look ugly on the surface and, 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 and when he does, we're to know that, that that ugliness doesn't reflect the way God actually is because we know how God actually is uh, through, through Jesus Christ. But rather, uh, that reflects the ugliness of the sin that God is bearing. But what will reveal God to us is when we exercise the same faith we have when we see the cross as a definitive revelation of God look through it, and we see God humbly stooping to bear the sin of his people. And so I, I, because I believe, I totally trust that God looks as he does in Jesus Christ, I don't believe that he's a genocidal deity. So when I come upon a portrait of God commanding genocide, uh, the ugliness of that surface I consider to be him bearing the sin. Uh, his people think of him this way. Uh, they're, 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 they're conditioned by their culture. And, and since God doesn't coerce, the power isn't coercive power, uh, he, 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 he has the influential power of the self sacrificial love, as Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, the cross is the power of God. Uh, he, he influences them as much as he can in the direction of truth, but there comes a point where he has to just accept them as they are. He enters into solidarity with them as they are. He stays in covenant with them as they are. And he continues to further his purposes in the world as they are, which means he doesn't first perfect their, their view of him. And since he's writing scripture through them, well, that's what's going to get recorded in scripture. And so it's, uh, um, we have to know, uh, if we trust that God looks as beautiful as he does in Christ, that becomes the criteria by which we decide whether the surface is an accurate reflection of God or whether the surface is a sin-bearing surface. And what will reveal God is when he, he steps into, uh, when we see God stooping uh, through the depth of the, the, these portions. That's the treasure that we find uh, if we dig for it. So that brings you up to speed. There we are. Whew. I use this analogy in, in cross vision, and I used it during our discussions, and someone thought I should bring it up here I, uh, again, because it kind of captures what I'm getting at. Suppose you had, and this, this is a true life story, I knew the uh, daughter of this missionary couple who went to this one tribe in Africa, a people group, and this tribe practiced female circumcision, which is horrendous. But you can't just march in there as a Western person and say, hey, this practice that you've been engaging in for centuries, uh, you've got to stop that. Because who are you? You don't have any credibility. You have to earn their trust and, 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 and whatnot. So for three years, they had to put up with seeing and hearing these young five, six-year-old girls be mutilated. 
and, and listen to their screams. Uh, at one point, they even they they uh, taught them how to sterilize their instruments so that the girls wouldn't get infected. And they brought in some uh, uh, anesthesia uh, to make it less painful for the girls and things like that. So it actually looks like they were condoning this and even helping it. Um, then after three years, the tribe had gotten to the point where they had had enough of the gospel foundation laid and enough belief and enough trust built up so that they could start to connect the dots of like, oh yeah, maybe we shouldn't be doing this to little girls. And the practice could be brought to an end. But imagine if somebody was recording the, every movement of these missionaries from the moment they first got there and writing down their activities. For the first three years, this person would have assumed that these missionaries were totally okay with female circumcision, and they even helped it. But once they, once the tribe was, was ready to accept who the missionaries really were and what they really believed, well now, now they would have totally reinterpret those first three years. And if, if this author kept on writing, they would have to trust that the later readers who know what the missionaries, who they really are, they would now look back on those first three years. And, and they'd see that what was really going on is is these folks were sacrificing for this tribe. How painful that must have been to, for three years, listen to these girls screaming. And, and now, that, now that everybody knows how wrong that was, you can appreciate the self-sacrifice of these, these, uh, these missionaries. That, I think, is an analogy of what's going on with the Old Testament. God was, he accommodated people where they're at. He influenced them as far as possible, but he had to bear their sin as much as necessary. But in Jesus Christ, now he comes out and he is the full truth. This is what God really is like. If you see me, you see the Father. They had glimpses of truth, but now we have the full truth, Hebrews 1.3. And so what I'm proposing is that's how we read the Bible. Knowing who God really is, we can look back and we think, oh, wow, he was, he was bending and accommodating. He was stooping just as he does on the cross because he's always been that kind of God. As I said so eloquently in the last lecture, uh, he dives into our poop. And where's our poop? All right. So, so now, he, he, what I want to flesh out is this. There's four aspects of the cross that I find that are significant to how we understand various aspects of, of uh, these violent portraits of God. I'm only going to get to three of them, and I may not get to the third. But uh, there you go. And, and what I want to do is, is uh, talk, to show the principles that I derive from my assessment of the cross. And then I, I'm going to... Uh, bring out some, some things that I find that confirm this, confirm this way of reading. This was, to me, the most surprising thing. 11 years ago, when I started down this new way of looking at things, you know, we always read the Bible through a certain lens, and as I started trying on this lens, I noticed things I had never noticed before. And certain things popped out and became significant that weren't insignificant before, because it seemed to confirm uh, this way of reading uh, the Old Testament. As, like, for example, I mentioned in the first hour, uh, I never noticed that there's these passages where God talks about his nonviolent plan to get the children of Israel into the land of Canaan and to get the inhabitants out. Uh, he was going to dry up the land so it wouldn't produce, and, or he was going to send pests ahead of time uh, to make it too pesky. But he was going to do it slowly, he said, uh, because he didn't want the land to become overrun with wild animals or, or bushes. But that's really significant. What are those texts doing there? And, and it, it seems to me that they confirm the interpretation that God wasn't the one who said, go slaughter everybody. God did say, go and add to the land. What Moses heard was, oh, I'm supposed to go slaughter everybody. Because in the ancient Near East, that's just what it means to take over someone's land. Um, and the fact that there was these nine violent plans, I think, uh, confirms that. Okay, so the first principle is, is the principle of cruciform accommodation, or cross-like accommodation. And by this I mean that in the process of God reading the written witness to his covenantal faithfulness, I see the Bible is sort of the the record of his covenantal faithfulness. God sometimes displayed his triune cruciform agape love by stooping to accommodate the self-revelation to the fallen and culturally conditioned state of his covenant people. And that's basically just what I have had, had, had shared so far, that God's a stooping God. He didn't start being that way on the cross. He's that way on the cross because he's always been that way. He says that we've been reading the Bible, I, I think, through the Christendom eyes and have wanted a triumphal God rather than a cruciform stooping God, and so we've been missing this. Uh, the early church was, was, was much more onto this. Okay, so here's some confirmations of this, that God accommodates. That, that the way God's portrayed in, in Scripture can, it's not necessarily accurate. It includes the perception of the person doing the writing. So the first thing is the, what I call the Rorschach quality of our conceptions of God. 
you know, Rorschach, uh, you, you, you have these tests where you put these ink blots and you're supposed to say what comes to your mind when you, and, and what it, they reveal is, is the, what you see says at least as much about you as, as what's actually on, on the page. <coughs> well, in scripture it seems that spiritual truth is like that. Uh, so that what we see in here, it reflects our hearts. Uh, we, we can only see in here what our hearts allow us to see in here. Uh, so the, the degree to which you are able to accept truth depends on your, your hearts. The Pharisees couldn't see that scripture uh, is about Jesus because Jesus says they did not have the love of God in their hearts. So our, our, our interaction with God and the scripture and all that, it's not just an intellectual exercise. What, what you're able to see reflects uh, the condition of your heart. And this is, a, I'm just giving you a small sampling here. Jesus at one point says, why is my language not clear to you? And he answers it. It's because you, you are unable to hear what I say. And the idea of hear, it has connotation of to grasp, to actually receive it. Uh, they, they, the spiritual conditioning, it went, in one, it went in one ear and out the other because their heart couldn't receive it. The disciples couldn't hear Jesus' many teachings about how he came to suffer and die. Craziest thing, all through his ministry, Jesus is saying, I've got to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested, you're going to turn me over, I'm going to be crucified, and then I'll rise on the third day. He, he says that consistently, and yet when it happens, the disciples are completely shocked. They're clueless. Um, they thought someone stole the body. What, what's going on here? And they're so discouraged because he got crucified. It wasn't until only until after the resurrection that they began to think, oh, yeah you, you, yeah, you did say something about that, I recall. And, and they, had that, they only remembered it after the fact. But it did, here's the thing. They are assuming, because almost all Jews at this time assume, that the Messiah was going to come and going to crack down on sinners and support the religious establishment and, and beat up the Romans and liberate Israel. That's what the Messiah is supposed to do. And that preconception was so thick that even though Jesus consistently taught that he was not going to do that, but it was rather going to be crucified, it was like throwing cheeks at armor. It's ding, 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 ding. That's why Peter, you know, when Jesus announces it in Matthew 16, he says, we will defend you, Lord. And that's when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Um, yeah, you're, 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 you're jamming my frequency. <coughs> so they were dull. They, just couldn't, they weren't able to receive that truth. And Jesus doesn't wave his hand and do a magical trick to lobotomize their brains so they get the truth. God always deals with us as we are, as persons, respecting our personhood. And so he works by means of influence, not coercion. And so there's this verse, uh, you find it two times. He says, to the faithful you appear faithful, to the blameless you appear, that should be a pure, not a pair, blameless, to the pure you appear pure, uh, but to the devious, ekesh, which means crooked, perverted, or twisted, you appear shrewd. That means torturous or deceptive or twisted. Uh, so the idea here is, if your heart is pure, then, then God will be able to reveal his pure self to him, the way he really is. But if you're twisted, to the degree that you're twisted, you're going to see a twisted God. You're going to hear a twisted God. God's going to be twisted. Uh, because your receptors are twisted. And so, how, how you view God says as much about you as it does about God, maybe a whole lot more. Uh, at another point we find, he says, when you did these things, I kept silent. You, you thought I was exactly like you. Uh, because God didn't come out and explicitly condemn these things, they assumed that he was okay with them. Uh, and we're always in the process of, we have to resist this, but we tend to make God into our own image. We think God's exactly like us. God always agrees with us, isn't that right? God agree. God's on our side. He's on our nation's side. We are always, we know the will of God. If I know God, thanks, just ask me. All right. So, so you, you find this truth you know, being communicated throughout scripture. Now, holding on to that idea, consider the fact that the Israelites, we have this repeated testimony, they were jaded. Uh, they, they're repeatedly depicted as stiff-necked people who resist the spirit. Uh, Hosea and Isaiah declared that there was no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. None. Even the spiritual leaders led people astray. Even God's appointed priests did not know God. So, if your spiritual condition influences how you experience God, what you hear about God, what you think God is saying, what you think God is doing, if that's the case, and if it's the case that Israel is this depraved, how could they not have jaded pictures of God? How could they have twisted? Um, 
And I, I include this passage just because I think it's so fascinating. It pops up out of nowhere. But uh, here, here it, it, this is an example of a jaded picture of God. Uh, Moses and Aaron are talking to Pharaoh. And this is one of their arguments to get Pharaoh to let them go. The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord, our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. <coughs> so here it looks like God is saying, Moses, Aaron, you get Pharaoh to let the people go for three days out in the wilderness. Well, I always thought it was supposed to be a permanent exodus. What's up with that? Um, and, and if you don't succeed, then I'm going to kill you. And maybe he's saying all the Israelites with the sword. Uh, you talk about high pressure sales. Uh, they're like, Pharaoh, he's going to kill us. Now, I think they really believe that because that's, that's the kind of thing that an ancient Near Eastern god would do. I mean, it's Al Capone ish, but, but, that, that's, but, but I don't think God actually said that. But here we're getting a reflection of kind of how, uh, to the degree that your heart is, is jaded and your mind is jaded, you're going to, you're going to, the guy that you interact with is going to feel jaded. All right, here's a third confirmation. You find examples of accommodation in the Bible all over the place. Even apart from the cross, we should come to the awareness that God is an accommodating God. When his ideal is impossible, he says, okay, well, what's the next closest thing that you're capable of? And if you're not capable of that, he goes to the next closest thing. He accommodates. He comes down to our level. So you find uh, in, 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 throughout the Bible, it starts in Genesis, that God has this ideal for marriage. He's supposed to be married. One sexual partner for life, that's it. And actually, if we take Jesus seriously, if you've ever thought about having sex with anyone other than the person you're presently married to, you've committed adultery. And he, I, I don't think he's just like using like poetry. Uh, in, in God's, I, anything short of God's ideal is, is missing the mark. And so, really, you should have, the first person you ever lusted after is the person you should have married if you're going to stick to God's ideal. But it's probably too late for that. <laughs> 10,000 times over. Uh, and so God always starts with where you're at. Okay, you, you, you already blew the ideal, but let's deal with the real. And so later on we find that God is even willing to compromise on monogamy, and he allows for polygamy. Uh, one theory on this is that, there, you know, back in the day, wars were so common, men got rare because they got killed in the battlefield, leaving women and children out on the street. And so God decides, look at. Uh, Better to compromise my ideal for marriage than to have women and children dying on the street, so he lost for polygamy. And then he goes even further at one point and lost for concubines, where these were women who weren't actually officially married, but they just sired babies with uh, the, the, the husband, um, because in return they got protection. So God's went, and they lost for divorce and remarriage, even though that's a fall from God's ideal and involves adultery. Uh, Jesus says, whoever marries the person, uh, whoever divorces his wife, causes her to commit adultery. He assumes that she's going to get remarried, because options for single women in the ancient world weren't very promising. Uh, but but uh, it involves adultery. But God still is willing to say, okay, if this is the best option, then, then let's go with it. He's a God who, 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 who even though when, when, once he does this, it makes him look like a, a, a polygamy-approving deity. And he takes on that semblance. In, in, in uh, 1 Samuel 12, or maybe it's 2 Samuel 12, he's, he's reading out David for getting it out of Bathsheba when he's already got 100 wives. Gosh, that guy was just... That, that was before the days of Viagra, too. I don't know how he did that. Um, <laughs> the, one of the arguments God makes is like, he goes, David, I gave you all these wives. I blessed you with all these wives. And I would have given you more if you wanted. Why would you have to go after Bathsheba? But here you think that, oh, he's okay with, 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 with polygamy. But actually, I think it grieves his heart. It's just that that's the reality of the situation. <coughs> or the whole deal with kings. God never wanted Israel to have a king because God never wanted people to have a king. You know, in, in, in Genesis, we're said we're going to rule over the earth and the animal kingdom. But there's nothing about us going to rule one another. Our only ruler is supposed to be God. And I still think that that's the case today. Yeah, you, you, we've got one master. Um, so we wanted Israel to model this a little bit to the other worlds. And so for the first, you know, however many hundred years, uh, there was no king in Israel. But then the people got scared, and, and, and they wanted to have a king to have some security so they could be like everybody else. And that's exactly what they said. We want a king that will go out and fight for us like all the other nations. And in 1 Samuel 8, uh, Samuel comes to the Lord and he's grieving over this. But the Lord says, hey, listen, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Which means if you're trusting in a human king, you're not trusting in God's king. And that's rejecting God's king. But God acquiesces. 
And he says, okay, fine. I'll give you a king. It's going to be terrible. It's going to be bad. But if that's what you want, that's what you're going to get. But once he makes that decision, you think that kingship was his idea. He works with this. He even brings it into kind of, you know, the, the, the David motif. Mm -hmm. And Messiah's going to be a king, and king like David. And he, he redeems it. But it was never his idea. And to appreciate this, you have to understand that throughout the ancient Near East, uh, kingship was, was a big deal. It was the center of their religion. God works to the, with the people through the king. And the welfare of, of the people uh, depends on the behavior of the king. So if the king doesn't behave, the God will punish the people. This is the framework for the whole ancient Near East. And as soon as God acquiesces to this kingship, he looks like a typical ancient Near Eastern king-centered deity. And you have all these refrains about how, you know, that's why the people suffer when David screws up and and, and, and does, does the census. But he's a guy who accommodates. What he's doing is exactly what he did on the cross. He's coming down and bearing the sin of his people and therefore taking on an appearance that reflects that sin. And the sin is thinking that he's, a, a, he's an ancient Eastern king deity. And all the <coughs> sacrifice is an interesting one. Uh, you know, there's no place where it suggests that sacrifices was God's idea. In fact, Sacrifices was a common denominator for throughout the ancient Near East, long before the Israelites ever came around. And the Israelites were sacrificing, you know, be, before they ever got ever got delivered out of Egypt. Um, in fact, at one point in, in, in Leviticus, uh, the Lord says, "Hey, okay, tell you what, stop sacrificing to the goat deities, and just bring your sacrifices to me." So it's like, I know you need to sacrifice because everyone's doing it, uh, and you're not ready to let that go. But let's change the meaning of this. And so make, make your sacrifices to me no longer to the goat demons. But it was believed that throughout the ancient East that the gods consumed the sacrifices. You offer up these animals and stuff, and the gods would come down and devour them. In the epic of Gilgamesh, he offers these sacrifices after the flood, like Noah did. And it says, the gods smelled the savor. The gods smelled the sweet savor. The gods crowded like flies about the sacrifice. And they come down and they devour it. Now, we, we never have uh, Yahweh depicted as though he was devouring the sacrifices. And by the way, this involved children too. Um, but he, so the, he, he was able, the Spirit was able to push them out of that primitive idea. But you still have this refrain 13 times that the sacrifices are a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And that was a, free, that was a common ancient Near Eastern idea. You smell the sacrifices and that tells them it's dinner time. And so God let them keep that. You're not ready to let that go. Okay, I, I, yeah, I really like the smell of those burning goats, for sure. Uh, I doubt it, but, but no, still later on, it becomes clear that God doesn't delight in sacrifices. In fact, in one of those passages, he says, that was never my idea. So this is progressive revelation where God's weaning them off of their, 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 their religious crutches that they borrowed from the ancient Near East. But all these, you would think that God was a deity who enjoyed the smell of, of burning goats. Um, and you, that, that's what it means to step in and to, and to bear the sins of people. Here's another confirmation, and this one was really huge for me. Um, whenever you have pictures in, of God in the Old Testament that are, are Christ-like, uh, and you have, there's a lot of them, there's a lot of you don't ever get the impression that I'm like down in the Old Testament. It, 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 it's got magnificent uh, portraits of God. The Spirit breaks through, but not always. And, and so to the degree that, that the pictures are beautiful, you know, the idea of like Yahweh as the groom and Israel as the bride and a love relationship, there is nothing, nothing in the ancient Near East that resembles that. It, it, it's, it's, it's unprecedented, which is one of the ways you know that this is the spirit of God breaking through. They're not borrowing that from the culture, that's for sure. But when they talk about God as a violent warrior, their portraits of God are very, resemble very closely all of the portraits of the deities surrounding them. Um, sometimes they even take hymns that were sung to the warrior deity and they just lift the thing out or these phrases of it out and swipe out their God and put in Yahweh. So it's, it's the ultimate cultural conditioning. Uh, and to appreciate this, here's what you need to know that throughout the ancient Near East, crediting God with violence was, was assumed to be an act of worship. Like the way you exalt your God was by highlighting the violence. Our God's greater than your God, and the more macabre the violence, the better. So, our God is going to eat your babies and drink their blood, and then we'll dance in it, you know. And, and they, they thought they were praising God. Even though, 
the pagans around them, they all knew that their gods didn't actually do all the violence that they credited them with because their gods don't exist. They did all the violence, but they always attribute it to their god because otherwise it would be insulting. And they believe their gods helped them do this. And so you give God the credit for all the violence. And so this is what you find throughout with the warrior portraits of God in the Old Testament. I'll give you one example of this because it's, it's an interesting example, or at least I think it's interesting. It may bore you to death, but we'll see. <laughs> so there's this Akkadalistic Ugaritic warrior deity named Anat. Uh, probably because these people practice military cannibalism where you eat uh, at least part of your victims because it was believed that you got their strength or whatever. And so their deity, since we always assume that God's just like us, since they eat their, their victims, their, their chief god eats these victims. And the, the Ugaritic songs to Anat are gruesome. Uh, it, but you find that the biblical authors borrow some of that language, but you can also see the spirit trying to push them beyond it. And I'll illustrate how this works. So, for example, in Deuteronomy 32, he says, uh, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and will repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives for the long-haired heads of the enemy. From the long-haired heads of the enemy. Okay, so you still have a deity who is going to drink blood and devour flesh, but it's attributed to his sword, uh, not to him. Uh, even though the metaphor doesn't work very well, my arrows will be drunk with blood, and my sword will devour flesh. So it, it's, there's a little distance there between what Yahweh does and, and the devouring, but it's still him doing it. And that's very much, that's a very net looking sort of passage. Or in Isaiah 34, the Lord is angry with all nations and wrath is on all, uh, uh, all their armies. He will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. Their slain will be thrown out. Their dead bodies will stink. The mountains will be soaked with their blood. That's a, a phrase that's very close to one of the hymns that were sung to Annette. This uh, pile of corpses, it's just macabre. My sword has drunk its fill of the heavens. Ah! See, it descends in judgment on Edom. The people I have totally destroyed, the sword of the Lord is bathed in blood. That's ancient. They, they're like saying, our God is supreme. Because look at the, how macabre's violence is. He eats your flesh, drinks your blood. But it's a little bit of improvement over the Anat stuff. And then Isaiah, he says, I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh. They will be drunk on their own blood, as with wine. So here's an interesting development. Because it's still macabre, it's still very not like But now, this passage is capturing something about the self-destructive nature of evil, which I won't be able to get into, but it's a central part of my thesis, that evil is inherently self-destructive. And Isaiah is getting that, so he's, the Spirit's pushing him along. The righteous will be glad when they are avenged, when they dip their feet in the blood of the wicked. Uh, that's another that thing, we're dancing in the blood of your foes. And that creeps into the Bible. I don't think Jesus would approve of that. Uh, oh, I can't wait to just go, you know, Tip my toe in the blood of my enemies. Ah, so it's so fun. Uh, <laughs> the Lord says, I will bring them from Hashan. I will bring them from the depths of the sea. That your feet may wade in the blood of your foes while the tongues of your dogs have their share. Ha <laughs> uh, ha! I tell you, that's... Uh, but that was our idea. Uh, you, you humiliate your enemy by dancing in their blood and let, let the dogs have their share. Okay, so those are some ways of confirming this first principle of cruciform accommodation. God's an accommodating God. I would believe it on the basis of the cross alone, uh, but given that I believe it on the basis of the cross alone, I look at the Bible and through this lens, and I find confirmations of it all over the place. Then the second principle is what I call the principle of redemptive withdrawal. And um, this one is interesting, kind of funky, and I have to go fast. Here's the whole thing. God judges sin, defeats evil, and works for the redemption of creation by withdrawing his protective presence thereby allowing evil to run its self-destructive course and ultimately to self-destruct. This is what God does at the cross. Um, the only thing he does, I mean, Jesus stands in our place, right? Uh, and and, and he, he bears our sin and our curse. Uh, but the only thing that God does is turn him over, withdraw, and let this happen to him. So on the cross, God judges the sin of the world by withdrawing from Jesus Delivering him over to wicked humans and fallen powers. And by, when I say withdrawn, I don't mean he withdrew his love or anything like that. I mean he just withdrew protection. Uh, and so Jesus bore our curse, he, which means he, was God, he felt God forsaken. And that's why he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he's standing on the inside of our sin and on the inside of our God forsakenness. He's experiencing that. But God didn't forsake him because this was the agreed upon plan from the beginning. But as Jesus is standing in that place, he's experiencing 
all of the death consequences of sin. One of the things that's interesting about the Bible, and I have hundreds of pages on this, and the speech of the Word of God, is that uh, punishment is not usually seen as something imposed, like forensic punishment or judicial punishment. It's much more organic. In fact, in, in Hebrew, almost always, the word that they use for the punishment of sin is a derivative of the same word for sin. You, you corrupted, therefore you'll be corrupted. And so the punishment is more like the natural consequences of your action. Sin is inherently self-destructive. So, and we have this motif, the father did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. He delivered him over uh, to death for our sins. There's a lot of violence that was done to Jesus. It was a violent judgment, but the father didn't lift a finger against him. The only thing the father did was let sin run its course. He's going to bear all the sin of the world. He's going to bear the god foreseen consequences of sin. And uh, all, all, the judgment is, is withdrawing. And so the cross gives me, I, I think, everything we believe about God should be anchored in the cross. I see this is, how, this is the, how God actually judges. And then when I start reading the Bible through that lens, I saw it everywhere. Um, I had never noticed it before. But here's a... Um, oh, I went working on say about this. When God decides he must withdraw protection, he does it with a redemptive motive because the purpose of the cross is the resurrection. The death is experienced for the, the redemption. And he does it with a, with, with a grieving heart. Uh, you know, Jesus, when he writes into to Jerusalem, uh, in Luke 19, he, he gives a prophecy about the destruction that's coming, but he, he does it while he's crying. In fact, the, the term that's used there uh, can be translated wailing. And this reflects the heart of God. Behind every terrible, judgmental picture of God you find in the Bible, you've got to imagine a weeping deity. Uh, this, this, this breaks his heart. Now, in the Old Testament, they got very little of this because that's totally foreign to the ancient Near Eastern way of, you don't have crying deities in the ancient Near Eastern world, but once in a while, the spirit pops through. And so here in Jeremiah, it says, after announcing a harsh judgment is coming, Dawi says, I will wail over Moab, for all Moab I cry out. I moan, I moan for the people of pure Herseth. I weep for you, as Jazar weeps, you vines of Sibba. So here's the broken heart of God. And that's what the cross would lead us to expect. The classic verse uh, on this, one that's most explicit, is, is, is Romans 1. So Paul begins by saying, the wrath of God is revealed. So he's talking about the wrath of God. And we, we all immediately think of emotion. Like, oh, he's so mad I could just. Um, but I submit to you that the, the wrath is simply God letting people experience the death consequences of their decisions. So for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who by their wickedness suppress the truth. Here's what it looks like. It says, that therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity. And then two verses later, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And two verses later, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a base mind and to the improper conduct so they were filled with all manner of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice. And he goes on for three more verses listing all the sins that they were filled up with. But the fact that God gave them up shows that God had been holding on. Because he was in his own way saying, don't go down this road. But they keep on resisting, 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 resisting. And there comes a point where God has to let, say, if he's not going to lobotomize them, not going to coercively turn them, he's got to let them go. And now they're going to experience the death consequences of their own decisions. The analogy I would use is this. Um, I had a relative who is, was a terrible drug addict uh, and alcoholic and just whatever. And um, we tried to, you know, you love the person. And, and so at first you go pick them up from the police station and you post bail for them and you clean up their messes and you know, try to minimize the damage that they're doing. Because the damage he does also hurts my sister and the kids. So you're, you're in there. But there came a point where you realize that as long as you keep doing this, he's going to keep doing that. And there, there's a point where you've got to say, well, we got to pull out. We've we got to let you fall. And my sister had to say, i got to let you fall. We're not doing you any favors by holding you up, allowing you to go on with this. And the fall, as some of you know, I'm sure, firsthand, can be very, very ugly. And just when you think they hit bottom, they redefine bottom again. And just when they think, okay, that for sure is bottom. No, they, and, but you've got to let, it's tough love. I think that, what else can God do? If, if God's mer he, mer he's, he's mercifully staying in the game, trying to protect us from the consequences of our own 
death decisions. But if that begins to harm us, and ena enabling us so we get deeper and deeper in trust in our sin, love's got no choice but to say, I'll let you go. And he does it hoping, with a redemptive motive, hoping we'll learn the hard way what we couldn't learn the merciful way. And he does it with a grieving heart. Like, I know this is going to hurt, and I hate to see you hurt, but that's what i got to do. <coughs> and, got, that's what's going on. and that's what the cross, that's how God judges. So here's some confirmations. Um, and I'm just going to, I mean, I talk about all these. Wait, there's my glasses. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so throughout the Old Testament, Yahweh judges by forsaking and abandoning people to foes. He hides his face from them. And I, I, I got 60 pages of this. Here's just two little snippets. The Lord is, is with you, it says in 2 Chronicles, with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Uh, he says, I have forsaken my house. I have abandoned my inheritance. It's a phrase you hear quite a bit. I have become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them. And the result will be disaster and calamities will come upon them. Uh, he says, Ephraim is joined to idols. In other words, we're for Israel. Leave him alone. That's the judgment of God. I'm going to leave you alone. That's the way you want. That's the course you want to go down. I'm going to let you go down that course. But I'm telling you, it's not going to be pretty. You find that over and over again. And here's what's interesting: Old Testament authors frequently depict Yahweh as doing things that their own writings made clear that He merely allowed, just like all the other ancient Near Eastern folks did. So, for example, He says uh, in, in Exodus 12, He says, "I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals." And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Okay, so it looks like God's going to personally go down there and kill the babies. But then, just 11 verses later, uh, if you read this, when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top of the sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. And the author of Hebrews is hints on that. It was the destroyer who killed these kids. So the picture you get, and the, the, this is very in line with the New Testament's picture of this world under bondage to Satan, but there's a destroyer who's biting at the bit and would love to kill every kid he can get his hands on. God is always holding back that destroyer, except in cases where he's got to let him go. And so here it's the destroyer that does the killing. Though the author attributes it to God. Why? Because everybody in the ancient Near East attributes whatever violence is involved in judgment to God. But God didn't lift a finger. Uh, you find this, this is an example of a pattern you find in Jeremiah and Ezekiel in particular. Uh, Yahweh says in Jeremiah 13, I will smash them one against the other, parents and children alike. Come in here and smash people together. I will not allow, I, I will allow no pity or mercy or compassion to keep me from destroying them. Now, you see, given that I know the true God in Jesus Christ and he prayed for forgiveness of everybody at the end, uh, and, and uh, he, he says we're, we're, we're to forgive seven, 70 times 7, which means unlimited. I, I can assess this. That reflects how his people think about him. That's the sin that God is bearing. But later on, you find out kind of what's really going on. Uh, he says, I will give Zedekiah, king of Judah, his officials and the people in the city who survived the plague, sword and famine, into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and to their enemies who seek their lives. He will put them to the sword. He will show no mercy or pity or compassion. You find this over 50 times in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, where the same violent verbs or, or emotions are applied to Yahweh, but then applied to Nebuchadnezzar or to the Babylonians in general. And as a matter of historical fact, God never lifted a finger against Israel. The only thing God did was hide his face or abandon or move out or withdraw or give them over. Uh, that's the real judgment of God. What reflects the sin that God bears and what reflects cultural conditioning is that they want to credit God with all that violence. Or here's another example. In the fight with Babylonians, uh, he says, your houses and places will be filled with the dead bodies of people I will slay in my anger. Looks like he's going to personally come down there and kill everybody. I will hide my face from the city because of all its wickedness. Now, already there you can see kind of a, you know, the, the spirit's pushing, but there's also cultural conditioning. Because how does God hide his face if at the same time he's personally coming down and slaying in this anger and wrath? But then later on he goes, I am about to give the city into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he will burn it down. And actually, he's the one who did burn it down. I will pour out my wrath on you, he says, and breathe out my fiery anger against you. One of the common images you have in the ancient Near East is the deities as, as fire-breathing monsters. And that's how he always portrayed it. He's Godzilla. He says, I, but then he clarifies, here's what it looks like for God to pour out his fierce anger. 
I will deliver you into the hands of brutal men, men skilled in destruction. So actually, God doesn't personally slay anybody. He just, with a grieving heart and with redemptive motive, turns people over to suffer the consequences of their sin. And now, I got time for, I, yeah, let me, let, me, let me just go cover a little bit of this third one. Because this is where it gets funky. Okay, so, th this is going to be funky for two reasons. One is, it involves spiritual warfare. And my experience with Western Christians is that we really have trouble believing in that. And it's going to involve some very, very bizarre stuff in the ancient and eastern world. But here, just try to keep an open mind, all right? Try? <laughs> so here's the thing. On the basis of the cross, I, I, I've derived this principle. The agents that carry out violence when God withdraws his protective presence to bring about a divine judgment include the perpetually threatening cosmic powers of evil. And the reason I think that is this. Uh, by means of the cross, the, the cross culminates God's conflict with rebel po uh, cosmic powers that runs throughout the entire biblical narrative. And, and uh, I don't have time to flesh that out, but trust me. So by means of the cross, God in principle disarmed the principalities and, th and authorities. He destroyed the devil's work. Uh, he, he, he came to break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is uh, the devil. That should be Hebrews 2.14, not 2.4. Maybe it's 2.4. No, I think it's 2.14. And to bring the cosmic rulers of the world to nothing. So the cross was the culmination of this cosmic warfare. And you find it throughout the Old Testament as God's battling the hostile waters. That's the way they saw evil in the ancient, in the ancient Near East. The waters that surrounded the earth, the raging waters. Uh, and there's also cosmic beasts in there like Leviathan and Rahab. Um, and, and, and that's just standard ancient Near Eastern stuff. Uh, in the New Testament, it becomes the principalities and powers and Satan and things like that. So the cross, part of what's going on the cross is this, this explosion of love on Calvary was bankruptcy of the kingdom of darkness. Uh, and in fact, God was causing evil to self-implode, though I can't get into that right now. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he masterfully turned evil against itself. That's, I call that the Aikido principle. Uh, Aikido is this martial arts technique uh, for pacifists. You never use any. You, you never use aggression towards the person who's having aggression towards you. But you become very good at. You know, they have moves to deflect it so that their own aggression backfires on them. Turn it like they're going to punch you and end up punching their own, themselves. And in Aikido, you do that to try to help them wake up to the violence that's in their own heart, and and try to enlighten them. Well, this is kind of what God does. He turns evil back on itself. So that's the principle. Now I'll give you two examples of this. Um, and here, here it gets weird. Realize we're reading very ancient literature. They think very differently than we think. But it's important for us as we're reading the Bible to try to get into their world. All right? So, Korah led this rebellion against Moses, right? Kind of mutiny. And said that some went also the earth opened its mouth, and some went down alive into the realm of the dead, when the earth opened its mouth and swallowed all those associated with Korah. Others were incinerated when fire came from the Lord, while others were slaughtered by a plague. So a massive slaughter going on. <coughs> now, here's the thing. No humans are causing that. Uh, but if it's the case, if, if, if my thesis is right, that God never acts violently, there's got to be other agents that carry out this judgment. And that's why the, the principle of cosmic warfare becomes really important. We don't normally go there. We probably read this and we think, oh, but this is God. He just opened up the earth and people fell into it. And God had sent out fire and God sent the plague. And it could be that the original author believed that, uh, though, though he doesn't explicitly say that. But now, so the cross leads lead me to suspect there's other agents involved. Is there any indication in the text that maybe there's other agents involved? Um, and it turns out there are. Wait, I keep losing my glasses. Oh, gosh. OK, so let's look at this. First, Paul says that these grumblers were killed by a destroyed angel. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, he's kind of talking about these various lessons we should learn. He says that they're destroyed by a, destroy, by a destroying angel. Most scholars think he's referring to number 16, since that's the most famous example of grumblers. But there's, there's several others, and he might be including them as well. But the thing is, there's no destroying angel in this narrative. What, what's happening here? Now, it turns out, just to give a little background here, Paul didn't originate this interpretation. We, we've got three other examples of it before Paul's time, where these authors, there was kind of a movement in Judaism where people were uh, uh, getting clear about the character of God, and so they were trying to put a little more distance between God and violence, or any kind of immoral activity, and they began to attribute to angels things that had previously been attributed to God. And so in these other three accounts, 
There's a destroying angel who does this destruction. Paul clearly is tapping into that tradition. And he's doing it for the same reason. Uh, he, he's assuming there's another agent there. Now, if you look at this thing, if you look at it through an ancient tradition eyes, you begin to find other agents. So, for example, the Ugaritic god Mot, he was believed to reside under the world, and he had jaws that reached up to the surface uh, that could devour people. The same was true of this Canaanite earth monster named Ares. Now, a lot of scholars argue that we find Mot and or Ares referred to in all those different passages about Sheol devouring people and stuff. They really believe that right under the surface of the earth was a monster, and, and it, it, its jaws reached up to the earth, and it's probably how they explain earthquakes or something, and it could devour people. Like, like, like tremors. You ever see that show? Okay. And some believe that the earth itself was a living being that was malevolent. Okay? That was. And many scholars argue that, not many, but some argue that, that the original audience, when it says the earth opened up its mouth, the, earth, the audience would have been thinking the earth opened up its mouth. That, this isn't poetry. That's why the people who weren't swallowed, they say, let's run away, lest the earth swallow us. They're not afraid of Yahweh, they're afraid of the earth. Because it's, it's eating people. I hate when that happens. <laughs> and some argue that the fire uh, was a, a fire from the netherworld. Uh, that came out of Moloch or Ares. That's another common conception of this. And uh, that's what devoured these folks. Uh, no, it's Satan, uh, Satan causes fire to fall from heaven, from the skies. Uh, when they say from the Lord, that's because they, they just took the sky to be the, the, the kind of the domain of the Lord. That's where he resides. So it comes from his locale. It doesn't mean that he actually sent it. Also, the beast in the book of uh, Revelation uh, causes fire to come out. It's interesting that plagues in ancient Near East were often associated with the Canaanite deity uh, uh, Resha. In fact, the word in Hebrew that's, that's translated plague, some scholars argue that that's actually the proper name of this deity. In fact, there's hundreds of examples where there are nouns that are used in our translation that scholars argue should be translated as the proper name of these deities. Get uh, the book Dictionary of... Uh, of demons no, and deities. No, de de yeah, demons and deities. It's a, but it's got all these deities. You, yeah, it just changes the reading of the Bible. So, and on a cruciform reading, God was allowing one form of evil to bring judgment on another. He normally tries to protect people from this, but uh, uh, there comes a point where he has to protect people. And now these demonic forces devour these, these, these agents or incinerate them. With a grieving heart, God stooped, or stopped restraining cosmic forces of destruction, thereby allowing one form of evil, Lord, Aries, Russia, to bring judgment on another form of evil, which was the grumblers. But there's some other destroying angel involved in that. Now, if you ask me the question, okay, Greg, but you don't believe the earth is a, is a devoured monster, so what really happened? My answer is, I have no clue. Uh, I stick, my job is to interpret the, the narrative. The narrative is what's inspired, uh, and its, it's authority is self-contained. It doesn't get its authority because it corroborates with someone's reconstruction of history. And so, I don't have to assess that. All I know is that I've got reasons here to think that there are other agents involved in this destruction. How, how to translate it into historical categories, I don't know. Um, and then I finally just make a note that Paul's introduction of the destructive cosmic agent could cover all the judgments of grumblers. Since he doesn't specify, some scholars have said, well, whenever grumblers are judged, there's a destroying agent. I think there's always a destroying agent. I'll, I'll close with this one. This one is... I thought this would be the hardest one. Because the Red Sea, no humans involved, no demons involved, just Yahweh opening the Red Sea and drowning Pharaoh's army. And most of us don't worry about that because we don't like Pharaoh's army anyways. But they were fathers and children and, and, and sons of mothers and people. And, and I can't believe it, I can't, I can't imagine Jesus drowning all, all these people. Okay, I thought it would be the hardest, but it turns out this was one that blew my mind the most. So it says, the enemy boasted, at this, at that's fair, I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils, I will gorge myself on them. But then you stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed your enemies. It's interesting that this author says the earth swallowed your enemies instead of the sea swallowed your enemies. And, and it, some have argued that this author is conflating the earth monster and the sea monster. But well, what's interesting is that there's six other references to the crossing of the Red Sea in the, the, the Old Testament. And all of them, what they highlight is not Yahweh drawing Pharaoh's army. 
what they highlight is God's victory over the sea. And the sea, in the ancient years, whenever you hear sea or waters in a context of judgment, know that you're not just talking about H2O. That was their way of conceiving of evil. So I'll show you this. Uh, Psalm 74. It was you who split open the sea by your power. And by the way, the word sea there is yom, which is also the name of a Canaanite deed of chaos. Uh, so it could be he's talking here about yom. That could be a proper name. You broke the heads of the monster in the waters. So Leviathan was not some natural creature, you guys. I know some of you hold that. We, there's never been a creature that we know that has had multiple heads. Besides, we, these are exactly pictures that we find in the ancient years, and they're cosmic beings. It was you who crushed the heads of Leviathan uh, and gave it as food to the creatures of the desert. You established the sun and the moon. It was you who set all the boundaries of the earth. You made both summer and winter. Okay, so among the funky things that are going on here is this author is taking the Red Sea crossing and he's fusing it with a, uh, uh, what's called a chaos conf motif. Uh, the, the belief that the, this creation came out as a result of war. God had to battle forces to bring about this present world. Uh, we always point to Genesis 1 where there's no conflict, and that's great, but there's a number of other creation uh, passages, and they all involve God having conflict with, with, the, with these other agents to bring them off the earth. So, but here, the battle is the battle of Yahweh with the sea. And then we find this one, the water saw you, God, the water saw you and rioted. And remember, we're not talking about H2O. We're talking about the sea monster. The very depths were convulsed. <laughs> the path led through the seas, your way through the mighty waters, though your footsteps were not seen. So you get this idea of the captain leading the army, but he doesn't need any footsteps because he's, he's invisible. But the seas, that, so the, the seas part because the mighty warrior shows up. We got we to gotta split apart. So he's dividing the monster. Uh, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So the, the victory is over the Red Sea. When Israel came out of Egypt, the sea looked and fled. Oh, run away, run away. That's Psalm 26. He rebuked the Red Sea and it dried up. And he led them through the, the, the depths as through a desert. So it's his victory over this cosmic beast. Was it not you who cut Rahab to pieces? So now they're calling it Rahab. Rahab was another ancient Near Eastern deity. Uh, cosmic beast. Who pierced that monster through? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made a road in the depths of the sea so that the redeemed might cross over? And then Habakkuk. Uh, with Pharaoh's own spear, you pierced his head uh, when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as, a, as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea, and that's Yam again, with your horses, cheering the great waters. So here, it seems that Yahweh defeated his cosmic foe and, and held it at bay, was his people passed through. So God's always holding forces of chaos at bay um, to prevent them from doing what they want to do, which is to destroy us, kill, steal, and destroy. But there's times where God has to let that go. And so then, with, with a grieving heart, Yahweh withdrew his protection, uh, thereby allowing one form of evil, Yom, Leviathan, and Rahab, to devour another form of evil, which is Pharaoh's army. And last thing I'll say, it, you have to know how frustrating it is for me to... to how can I just censor? Because <laughs> I got so much more to say about it, but I'll just say this. One thing that's just fascinating is that, that um, okay, so Pharaoh's army is also depicted as a cosmic monster. Uh, you find that in a number of passages. They, they're, uh, they're the personification of the beast. Of these. And so, and you have this motif as Yahweh, or, or Pharaoh's hungry. He's going to gorge himself on the Israelites. But now the monster who wants to do the gorging gets gorged. Aikido. A guy, guy just one form of people to defeat another. And this Aikido here, I, I, I don't think it's an, an accident, because it start, the whole thing with God versus the, the gods of Egypt and, and with Pharaoh, it starts off, the first miracle is, Aaron turns his rod into a serpent, Pharaoh then has his magicians do the same thing, his serpent swallows their serpent. And the word that's used for serpent there, serpent isn't just like a little snake, it's tanim, which is the same word that's used for these cosmic foes. So you have the serpent devouring serpent. And in each of the plagues, that's, that, that kind of thing is going on. God's allowing evil to, to uh, destroy evil. And it climaxes with the Red Sea. When God masters the Red Sea, holds it at bay, protects his people from it, and then lets the monster do what the monster wants to do when Pharaoh's army is trying to go through. Again, if you ask me, okay, well, what really happened, I can't tell you. And I don't care. Uh, what's revelatory is the text and uh, making sense of the text in light of the cross. Okay, I talked too long. But let's open up for questions. Who wants to be first?
Sorry, I got caught talking kind of fast there. <coughs> yes. Uh, my name's Sean. And Hello, Sean. The support you gave for accommodation all came from the Old Testament. Do you think that there's some cases where there's accommodation in the New Testament? And depending on your answer, could accommodation of the church to the world today be justified? Oh, good, okay. good, great. Um, yeah, th I think that there's there's definitely accommodation going on in the in the New Testament. Um, not everyone got the full revelation of God on the cross with equal clarity and with equal speed. I, I mentioned in the first hour that I think Paul got it much better than Peter did. Um, he saw that in Christ there's neither male, female, and bond, nor, uh, uh, free, uh, neither Jew nor Gentile. Uh, whereas Peter still, like, Paul had to ring Peter out in Galatians 2 because he was, didn't want to eat with the Gentiles. Um, and I think Paul's understanding of, of, of marriage was transformed by the cross in a way that Peter never got. Uh, you still have slavery being known. Although, it, it, as happened in the Old Testament, yeah, we, we have to accept this right now, but Paul totally transforms it when he tells us, you know, an interest, treat your slave like, 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 like a brother in Christ. Well, that's going to take away the whole slavery thing then. So there, there's a combination that goes on. And some of the authors, I, I think, just uh, still use Old Testament kind of language that isn't quite consistent with the cross, but yeah, there's some of that going on. And so can the church accommodate things in the world today? Yes. We do it all the time. Uh, if we didn't, none of us would be in there. We, 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 we accept each other as we are, saying let's all try to be moving in this direction, but there are, there are things about you uh, that may, are not going to change, and if, if I get to know you, I just know that that's part of what it is to love you. I, I have to accept you in that imperfection. Uh, so I think God's always divorced and remarriage. That's, um, Jesus and Paul make it very clear, it's better to stay single. Actually, in the fallen world, it's better never to get married. But they both acknowledge that not everyone can handle that, so go ahead and get married. But stay married, but if there's divorce, well then, even there, there's, there's an, stay single if you can, but if you can't, then it might be better to marry. So yeah, we're always doing that. Good question. Yes? How is, uh, What's your name? Kyle. Kyle. How is withdrawing not an active force of God, um, especially with like collateral damage of the firstborn in the Exodus story? Like how do we not, like he's removing and letting evil, but you're talking about the innocent. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, uh, yeah, well, it, 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 this is part of the, this world is that when um, when God gives authority, uh, you have that authority whether you're using it for good or evil. And uh, when you use it for evil, everything underneath you suffers. Um, it's uh, there's, an old there's an old African proverb that when the elephants fight, the grass suffers. Um, and so, uh, so a parent that gets addicted to crack is still going to be the parent, but the kid's going to suffer for it. And then that's. That doesn't fit our individualistic fairness grid, but it, it's part of the reality of the world. And so here, the rebellion of parents is going to have consequences for the kids. I, I just thought there's no other way to, to do it. I think it's... Yes, good luck. Yeah. Uh, so and what's your name? Andy. Hello, Andy. So you talked about um, judgment as being culturally conditioned. Uh, so my first judgment? That, yeah. You were talking about Isaiah. Um, Okay, keep asking off. Anyway, um, I guess with that, like, how would you say that, like, the spirit is is poking through, like, this imagery of, of judgment? Because I think it's probably both in the old and the new. Uh, well, it, it, I, I'm not at all calling the question that God judges. In fact, I've taken some beatings from folks who are left left of me theologically. Think. <laughs> Yeah, I love this. They're calling me a fundamentalist, and the fundamentalists are calling me a liberal. So you're doing something right. If everybody hates you, you're doing something right. Uh, but you know, that God judges is, I think, that's a consistent thing, because the cross is all about judgment. Jesus is bearing the judgment of, of, of our sin, which is simply the natural consequences, the death consequences of rejecting the God of life. You know, it, there's that one proverb that says, all who hate me love death. Because God is life, and to say no to God is to say yes to death. But God in his mercy stays in the game, trying to keep us from death, as long as there's hope of that turning us around. And if, but if it starts enabling us, then he has to let us go. What, what, the cultural piece is in thinking that God is the violent agent in judgment. Uh, or that God is the, the, the ferocious, you know, he's out of control rage. Uh, you, you get that in the Old Testament sometimes. At one point in, in Jeremiah, he says that his wrath burns against Israel. I will slay the righteous along with the wicked. And he, he, he just like, I'm going to indiscriminately kill everybody because I'm so mad. 
Well, that's an ancient Near Eastern God. That's not the God revealing in Christ. Uh, what reveals the God in Christ is that God was not above uh, loving Jeremiah and working through Jeremiah and even breathing his word through Jeremiah, even though Jeremiah thinks he's capable of that. So that's the cultural condition part of the judgment. How would you see that in the New Testament? Um, well, in, I, I think the same holds in the New Testament. And actually, I don't have any, I don't find any portrait of God in the New Testament, though I'm not going to be able to defend it here, but where, where God is the agent of violence. People put, look at Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, and they think, well, look, God killed them. I assume with you that, that God didn't kill them. Uh, it says Satan had filled their hearts, and Satan is the one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And so I have reason to think that. And Peter had something to do with this, but I, to explain that, I'd have to go on a different rabbit trail. Get the book. This is just the infomercial. You can't explain everything. Yes? Thank you so much. Um, and your name? My name's Nathan. Nathan? Yes, absolutely. So I was wondering if you could on your last name. <laughs> Nathan, absolutely. I, 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 I've never heard that last name. Is that Norwegian? Yeah. So, watch. Um, I'm having trouble with the consistency of God giving you himself so God's not responsible for it. Mm. If I stand by and let, like, let's say if I call a hit on somebody, yeah. and, so, and the guy I paid to kill someone kills them, yeah. I'm still responsible for it, and everyone would agree. Of course. If, I, if, if my child keeps going to like bad parties, and I warn them that, hey, you might get hurt, you might get assaulted, and I decide to, you know what, do what you want, and they go to a party anyway, and I stand there and watch them get hurt, I am still partly responsible for my child getting hurt. So I was wondering if you can, um, sure. even though, because I, I, I do understand, I do understand that allowing someone to experience the full consequences of their actions, is a teaching moment. It's a good teaching moment, actually. It's something that's very necessary for a lot of people. Right, right, right. I get that. But does that also mean that God is suddenly not responsible? Because if God's like, you know what, I'm just going to send demons into your life. He's going to torture Paul just a little bit. I'm just going to send plagues. Just let, like, Satan run wrong. Okay, and kill him. And if, like, if, that, if like, that's what God was doing, then you're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so but like, you're missing a couple of things. Okay. The, 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 the grieving heart. Yeah. He's like, oh, it's going to go. So, yeah. so wait, if you're a, a, a father and your daughter is, is okay. you know, 18 okay. and, and she wants to go to the party and you say, yeah. well, it could be, you know, there, there's some danger there. Okay. I would encourage you not to go. But at some point, you've got to, they've got to grow up sooner or later. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and so if, if she got hurt, mm -hmm. that wouldn't be your fault, I don't think. You were letting her be yeah. an adult. Um, but everything depends on the analogy here. Uh, if you use the hitman analogy, then clearly God would be responsible. Yeah, okay. But that's not, that, that analogy just doesn't apply. Because um, God's not trying to t pay a hitman to take anyone out. Okay. Uh, the, the analogy that works best is of the, the tough love of, of a drug addict. I use the hitman because this is the Egypt situation when he says it's the, the, um, the blood on the doors. And right, right, right. There's no Passover. And he says that he's going to, he said specifically that, hey, I'm going to do this. And then the ink or the death <coughs> of went and did this. Right. So it's just like, wait, is it. Is it uh, these people are paying the consequences of their action, or is it that God said that I'm going to do it and then demon went and did it? Well, it, so, like, so the, the the I'm going to do thing. That's the part where I that's an ancient Eastern thing. 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 They 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 okay. can tell the difference between God and Satan, you okay. know, and so they and they feel in, they're insulting God if they don't give him the credit for the violence. Oh, okay, okay. And so so and I think there's some cultural stuff going on along here. All right. But the the main point I want to get out of that is that. There is a thief who comes to kill, steal, and destroy, who would like to kill us all, like fighting at the bait. So he, it's not like I was saying, hey, Satan, come over here and do this. He's already there. He would like to have all the kids. Uh, it's just that God protects those he can't protect, but then if others he has to let go, he lets go. Okay. But it's with a grieving heart and with the hope that they'll learn the hard way. Not that he's not No, 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 no. He, 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 no, of course, of course. Jesus yeah. wails going into the room. Yes. Okay. Uh, and what's your name? Casey. Casey. And the um, Sunshine Band. So I've been, yeah. So I've been, I mean, I've, I've been reading your uh, books for a while now since uh, one of my friends who's a Calvinist gave me a book that Brewer gave him, uh, which is Satan, the Problem of Evil. Uh -huh. You didn't like it. I bet he didn't. But I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you're, I like it. You're smart, exactly. Let's agree on this right now. You don't like it, I'll probably like it. Um, and so, so I, just, I just love uh, everything you're writing and happy Congress nerds. Uh, okay. But I do have a, a question that okay. I haven't had answered yet. Um, 
And I'm glad that he already brought up the kind of defended against uh, Ananias and Sapphira and accommodation within the New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, um, how do we then trust uh, if the New Testament authors were able to ah. depict God poorly post Christ? You know, so this, so this is after Revelation. Right, right. How do we trust that their perception of Christ depicted in their literature uh, is accurate of Jesus? Very good. With his love, he w We might have created an epistemological crisis. We might have sought off the grass that we we're sitting on. So, yeah, so how, how do you find something that's solid that you can say, okay, this is the criteria for everything? And here I would have complete shift tracks. Um, I would talk about, like, I've got historical, critical reasons for thinking that the Gospels are generally reliable. It, 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 the case on that, uh, I wrote a book called The Jesus Legend. Um, that if you subject the Gospels to the same, so my starting point isn't with the Bible, it's God's Word. Um, I, I believe that because I believe in Jesus, and I believe in Jesus because I have historical, critical reasons for thinking the Gospels are generally reliable, and, and that it, Jesus is who, are, who they say he is. And so I anchor their uh, presentation of Jesus' teaching and life and crucifixion in, in historical, critical thinking. I've got other reasons for thinking it's true as well, but uh, that's that, that's the starting point, and then everything else is derivative from that. Okay, cool. Yeah, that answer. Very good. Yes. Uh, yeah. And what's your name? Oh, Kate. Kate. Um, so regarding like accommodation in the New Testament, you talk about like the cross and how Jesus came to kind of like, get involved in our craft, and like you see in the New Testament, he does miracles. He like heals demon possessed. Like he intervenes in the life of people, and he right. even, like deals with the demons of the spiritual force. Why then in the Old Testament does he choose to accommodate rather than like intervene and kind of give like a better picture of who he is? Why is that like why is there kind of a difference between the New Testament and the Old Testament? I, I think you see a progress throughout the Bible on this. And and I, I think it's because God always meets people where they're at. And so um, if you're a two year old, he treats you in a two year old kind of way and you're gonna have to see a two two year old God. Uh, he'll take on the semblance of that. And then when humanity grows to be five years old, it, it matures a little bit. Uh, looking back at it, you can see the, the nonviolent plans of getting into the land of Canaan are a classic case in point. I think God was at different times saying, I'm not like that, I'm like this. But they couldn't get that. In fact, that's a common refrain throughout. Um, the, you, if you trust me, you won't have to fight. Uh, I'll do your fighting for you. Um, but they, so whenever they use a sword, it shows that they're not trusting God. And, and, and yet God continues to work with them, though it makes them look like a violent, ancient, nearest deity. So I think the reason why you get more, you get the truth in Jesus, the way that you don't, you only get glimpses of it in the Old Testament, is because that's all they were capable of. Uh, so this, God's always pushing them as far as he can, but he stops short of coercion, and therefore has to bear their sin as much as necessary. Yeah, yes? Uh, hey, uh, would you attribute Death and acts to as well. uh, th th that's a good one. I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, the, the angel struck him down, right? Is that? Okay, the thing about angels is it's funky, and I'll just say this and, and go to sleep on this. But okay, so we always assume that angels are the good guys and bad guys. There's demons and there's angels, um, and that they're solidified. But what if there's some that are still in this kind of probationary period, like we are, where we're still deciding? Which ones we're gonna? Which way we're gonna go? In Psalms 82, um, we, we find that yeah, it, it says that there's an assembly of the gods, uh, and you find this, the heavenly council seen quite a bit in the Old Testament. So God's having a heavenly council meeting, and interestingly enough, He reads these gods out. He says, "How long are you going to be standing up for the oppressed and or, or you know, for the for the rich and the oppressor?" And I've called you to care about the widow and the, the orphan and the, you know, the oppressed. Instead, you're on the wrong side. And he basically says, shape up, uh, or you're all going to die like mere mortals. So, he, so these angels are gods. Uh, they're, not, they're not altogether evil because they're in the council and they're still given a good job description. But they're not altogether good because they're not carrying out their job. So with the spiritual world, it's a lot more complex than that. And this angel, off Herod, um, you know, it could have had sincere motives. It's kind of like what, what God does in, in, uh, uh, with governments. In, in Romans 13, which is so badly abused, 
Uh, but, so in Romans 12, Paul says, okay, you guys, I don't want you to ever take vengeance. Leave all vengeance to God. That's God's business. Your job is to love your enemy, give them some food when they're hungry, give them some drink when they're thirsty, right? Then he goes over, and remember, in the original, there's no chapter divisions. He says, God uses the agents of government as agents of vengeance. They carry the sword. Um, it, it says God has established all these governments. The word there, the word, the word is tassel. And it has a connotation of filing something. It doesn't mean that he, he wants these governments to be this way. Because governments wasn't part of God's idea in the first place. He hates kings. Um, but, but since they are going to use the sword, God's going to be at work to get them to use it as much towards justice as possible. Because in the fallen world, a lot of people won't do the right thing for the right reason. They only do it if they're going to get caught. So he'll use the sword. But there, God tells them to, uh, to the, the, the vengeance that we're not to do, that's what goes on in government. Um, so leave all that, to, which is the opposite of what, how it gets used today. Like, we're supposed to be in the government so that we can be agents of God. Uh, all that is to say, God uses agents who he doesn't agree with to carry out as much good as possible, given that that's how they are. And so I think the same thing could be true in the angelic realm. It's a probably longer answer than I needed. Yes, Caleb. Yes. Uh, so I really appreciate the fact that you are trying to like, deal with these issues in the Bible. Of the Bible the We've got it. Um, with it. Um, well, so like still holding to inspiration. Um, and so, well, like, That's the selling point. But, right. And so uh, like, so my question then is, like, how would you define inspiration then? Or, like, so specifically, how would you, like, what is inspired about a text saying, the, the text, like a section of the text that says, like, that's God telling um, the his Israel, his people to kill women, children. Okay, and good. Yeah. So here's one thing. I, I, I have become an addict of the cross. I really, I think, mean, Moldman said this, that all of the mysteries of Christian theology are found in the cross. Uh, and I just think that it, it's everything. So people assume that we, if we, assume, we think we know what it is for God to breathe something. And, and like all of our assumptions, it screws us up. So people think, well, look, God's perfect, and so if God breathes a book, it must be perfect. So it must be inerrant. And that, that doctrine has caused more people to, I'm sorry if I offend anybody here, but I have seen more people crash and burn on that doctrine. I'm one of them. Because you go to thinking, oh, the Bible's a perfect book. Take, take one class in the Bible's literature, and you find out it ain't so perfect. Um, and then, well, I guess they picked the wrong day to become a Christian. So if you look at, how did God read the cross? The, the revelation of the cross. And here's what I find significant. The cross involves God acting toward us, right? God took the initiative. He became a human being. Put himself in a position where he's going to be crucified. Gave all the teachings, blah, blah, blah. So it's God acting toward us. But it also involves God allowing people to act toward him. And all the violence done to Jesus was done by people acting under the influence of the principles and powers. And insofar as the cross reveals God acting toward us, it's beautiful. Insofar as it involves God allowing people to act toward him, it's ugly. But that's the definitive God-breathed revelation of God. So it's not a unilateral thing. It's a dialogical or a relational thing. Uh, and so if that's how God breathed the cross, shouldn't we think that's how God breathed scripture? So scripture is going to reveal God acting toward us, and so as far as, he, as much as possible, but also God allowing us to act toward him and condition the way he appears just as happened on the cross. God appears ugly because he's allowing ugly people to act on it, and now he's going to mirror their sin. And so we read the Bible for that lens. On one level, everyone kind of acknowledges that because no one goes to the dictation theory. Uh, where you know, God directly wrote everything, because otherwise you'd have a uniform divine style and it would be perfect. But instead you find the authors reflect their own perspective, their own writing styles, their own whatever. And even faults of there, like Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.13, he, he says, uh, I, you know, he's, he's dealing with all these divisions at Corinth, and he says, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you, except for Crispus and Gaius, uh, so that no one can brag that they were baptized in my name. I did baptize the house of Stephanus. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't know who I got baptized, or where did that guy? But my point is, I, I, so he, he's correcting himself. He makes an error, and then he corrects himself. Uh, well, I think God's got a perfect memory, but Paul doesn't, and God reads through Paul just as he is, not as he wishes he was, and so that affects what appears in this God read record. So you have to read it. It's kind of doing it both ends throughout the whole thing. And the criteria would be, insofar as anything in Scripture 
is consistent with and points towards the beauty of the God revealed on the cross, that is the Spirit of God breaking through. And insofar as anything mirrors the ugliness of the cross, that is where God has to accept people as they are. And now the revelation will be for us not a direct thing, but an indirect thing, where we by faith look through the ugliness to behold the beauty of a God who stoops to meet people where they're at. So in response to that, then, so then the inspiration in the images that where God, where humans are acting, um, but like in ugly ways towards God, right? So the right. inspiration is that, in that, is that we can see through it and, and see God. Is that where, is that where the like, is that where the inspiredness of it comes? No, it, that that's where your faith is, is being able to see the revelation of what's inspired. But see, here's the thing about this, okay? Like, so. Here's the deal. People, because they have worked with this unilateral idea of God breathing, though no one is consistent with that, um, but they, that's what they work with. They think that this is supposed to be a perfect book. And then what happens is we find out, oh, there's errors and there's contradictions and historical mistakes and things. And so then we try to water down the inspiration to get around those things, those problems. Uh, and, and, and so it's like, so then we re redefine inspiration as on faith and matters, but not on other things. And, and you have a, but we're doing the songs and dance because we have first assumed that inspiration is supposed to be perfect. But if we keep our eyes on the cross, look at on the cross, God reveals himself fully through the one who bears all the sin of the world. So clearly, it's no problem for God to breathe through sin uh, or through imperfections. Uh, the, the cross embodies all that. And that totally takes away this game of trying to dance around the imperfect. The, the sinful parts are inspired for the same reason that the cross, the Boral is inspired. And so I'm right now writing a book. Uh, it's called Perfect Imperfection. Or I don't know what it's going to be called, but that's what I'm writing <laughs> And he says, well, we've set this whole thing up wrong. Uh, that it, it, it's like the revelation of God on the cross isn't a revelation despite the sin. No, it's a revelation because of the sin. Because that's what God was willing to step into. So there are no problems in the Bible. The so-called problem parts of the Bible are part, an essential part of the inspiration. I think every one of those faults and human stuff and it's the sin and all that, it all points to the ugliness of the cross. That's always been diving into ugliness. And it's, it's, just, it's just like, that, 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 that thinking is so pagan. Did you ever see uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yeah. Uh, and you remember that scene where, I, I don't know if it's the first or the second one, but they go in and they finally find the Holy Grail, and there's all these different grails up there, and the guy who's doing the, that they, who's supposed to watch over this, he says, you must choose which one is the, 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 the cup that Jesus drank out of. So the first guy, he's thinking, oh, here's a big shiny one. This is the glass of a king. This is what a, a, a mighty Jesus would have uh, had drank it out of. So he drinks out of that, and then he incinerates. And the guy goes, he chose poorly. <laughs> and the right cup was the humble cup, the carpenter's cup. And, and see, we're all, the disciples, they wanted a, they, they thought they knew what a perfect Messiah would be. He's going to come and take Rome and Bob, deliver in Israel. Well, they wanted a flashy warrior shiny, victorious Messiah, the one that God got crucified. Uh, we, we keep on trying to force God into a box that he doesn't want to fit into. Uh, I, I, the God who gets revealed on the cross is, the, the last thing he would think he'd do is have a perfect book. Uh, no, he's going to have a, a screwed up book. It's going to be it's going to be a human book. It's going to be messy in a lot of ways. He dies into messiness. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. You guys are uh, good questions. Is it almost hot in here? It's getting hot in here. So take off all your one more. One more. Last one. I guess this guy's got to help. Your name? Uh, Max. Uh, I guess he's having trouble agreeing with your stance on how God accommodates for force. I guess that's his kind of. But I, I always give people the right to be wrong, so I. I, 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 I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so what, what is the problem with uh, it? I just like, I don't see how God would like agree upon. He did. He accommodates. Well, he allows it. Yeah. The hardness of your hearts, Jesus says. I, so that, that already tells you that some of the stuff here is not what God really wants. It's because of the hardness of your hearts, he's going to accommodate this. But, but I, 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 I think Jesus assumes uh, that in Matthew 5, he says that you know, he's, going at the, that he's going after these uh, Pharisees. And Sadducees, they're arguing about what are the justified grounds for divorce. And some held, hold a loose line that you can divorce your wife if she doesn't bring a breakfast on time. Others are saying, no, it's only if she commits adultery or does something immoral. And Jesus just like, cuts them off the kneecap, saying, didn't you read from the beginning? In the beginning, God said, when God, God is ready to go, let no one put a son. So this debate is stupid. 
Uh, and he says, whoever divorces his wife causes um, a person who marries her to commit adultery. Because the, if the ideal here, then uh, the adultery is anything that falls short of that, including thinking about having sex with somebody that's not your spouse, and including remarriage. But yeah, so it's sin, but sometimes, the question is not what's the holy alternative, the question is what's the least damaging sinful alternative? All right, okay, let's give it a Thank you guys. <laughs>